Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecute the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Well, good evening. Welcome to Christ Community Chapel. I'm so glad that you have uh, joined us tonight. If we've not met before, my name is Jimmy Cozy. I'm one of the pastors here at CCC and just Really excited to have the opportunity to look into God's word with you tonight and see what it has to say for us. And we are, the, this is the first week of a new series we're going to be doing here called The Theology of Happiness. And this year, our theme has been that we want to listen to God. We want to hear what God has to say. And there are a lot of voices out there that will tell us what it means to be happy, how to be happy, and how we're supposed to get there. But we want to look at what Jesus has to say about what it means to be happy. And to do that, we're going to look at a section of Scripture that's known as the Beatitudes that you saw so wonderfully read by those kids. There are a bunch, a series of statements where Jesus will say, this is what it takes. This, these are the markers, the roadmap of a happy life. And so today we're going to be looking at the first of those statements from Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. And as we explore this passage together, my outline will be as follows. The, the first point will be that Jesus wants us to be happy. Jesus wants us to be happy. Secondly, Jesus knows how to be happy. He knows how to be happy. And then finally, how it actually happens. So if you're a note taker, you can write those down. If you're not, maybe keep them in mind as sort of the the signposts that will guide our time together this evening. But Jesus wants us to be happy. Jesus knows how to be happy. And then Jesus, and then how it actually happens. And so the first idea is simple. Jesus wants us to be happy. I'm going to read uh, again from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. If you have the Bible in the pew, I have that up here. This is found on page 759. If you don't have a Bible, it's going to be on the screen behind me as I read. But Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 3 says says this. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. One of the most profound statements I've ever heard a person make came from a really good friend of my wife's, a woman by the the name of of Deb Whitus. And Deb passed away this past July. She was ill for a really long time with a form of cancer that that for years she had battled and gone through treatments and and suffered through a, a long and debilitating illness. And uh, Deb and her husband Paul actually live across the street from my wife and I. And for the last, I don't know, maybe seven or eight years, Deb has actually served as my wife's mentor. So Deb was in our house. My my wife was in her house uh, on a constant basis. And as Deb was nearing the end of her life, the last few weeks she spent in a facility that was maybe a little bit better equipped to care for her specific needs at that time. And so my wife and others would visit Deb on a really regular basis. My wife at that point was probably going every other day, four or five times a week to see Deb. And what was interesting was that Deb was, was very ill at this point and she was suffering in immense ways. But every time my wife would go to visit Deb, she would come back and she would say things like, man, I really felt like I was trying to go to encourage Deb. But what would end up happening is I would come back saying, Deb actually was the one who encouraged me. 
And she told me about one particular conversation that she had with Deb that I don't think either of us will ever forget. She was sitting next to her bed and just said, is there, is there anything I could do? Deb was obviously in pain. Is there anything I can do to help you be more comfortable? What, what do you need? And Deb looked at my wife and she said, Emily, comfort, has, comfort is not the goal. Comfort has never been the goal. Service is the goal. And if you knew Deb, you knew that that was characteristic of her life, that even when she was suffering, she was marked by a deep sense of contentment and peace and joy, such that she was always thinking about other people. I mean, if you go to my house right now, you can't go 15 feet without seeing something that Deb put there. She never missed a birthday. She never missed a Christmas. She never missed an opportunity to send Paul over with a, a cookie or a cake or something for one of my kids. In my office, there's a wall hanging of a hymn that she knows that I love. She heard me mention in a sermon one time, and then a couple weeks later, a package showed up on my desk with a wall hanging of that hymn. That's the kind of person that she was, even in the midst of suffering. And so the question that I want us to consider is how does somebody get like that? How does somebody find a contentment, a sense of peace, a sense, a sense of security that, that goes so deep that whatever life throws at them, they remain steadfast, and it seems like their ability to be joyful and happy is unshakable. And as we look through the Beatitudes together, and you see this word, blessed, Jesus will say, blessed is the person who does this. Blessed is the person who does that. We're going to say this is the theology of happiness, but when you hear happiness, that's what I want you to think of. I want you to think of the, the kind of happiness that runs deep down into our soul, that results in deep gratitude, deep contentness, a sense of joy that runs deep down into the very core of who we are. And I think if we were all honest, every single one of us wants that. And so what the Beatitudes offer for us is how to get there. And, if you're, and, and what I want you to know is that Jesus also wants that for us. If you're new to Christianity, or maybe if, even if you've been around Christianity for a long time, maybe you haven't considered the idea that Jesus wants us to be happy, that Jesus wants good things for us. You know, at another point in Scripture, Jesus will say uh, that God is a father who likes to give good gifts to his children. But the trick is, sometimes it doesn't look the way that maybe we would have conceptualized it ourselves. But Jesus will say things like, what kind of father, if his son asks him for a loaf of bread, will give him a rock? Or what kind of father, if his daughter asks him for a fish, will give her a snake? And what Jesus is saying is that God knows how to give us the good things that we want in the way that we need to have them, in the way that is best for us. And, and if you're a parent, you know that if we always gave our kids exactly what they want, whenever they wanted, that would actually be extremely unloving and might actually lead to less happiness and not more. But in the same way, Jesus wants good things for us. He wants us to be happy. That's why the Beatitudes are here. They help us to see how do, what are the markers of a life that is truly happy, of a life that has joy that goes down into the very core of who we are? But even further than that, Jesus wants us to be happy, but Jesus also knows how to be happy. That's the next thing that the Beatitudes show us. You know, it's not enough that he wants us to be happy because he also has a plan for how to get there. And one thing we ought to consider before we get into the details of what exactly he says here is that, that maybe we don't actually know as well as we think we do how to be happy for ourselves. I mean, happiness is an industry at this point in our culture. There are books and podcasts and YouTube channels and social media influencers who are out there and all of them are devoted to helping us live the best life we can live, to helping us live the happiest life that we can live. And so my question is, we have more of what it conventionally, more of what the conventional wisdom would say would make us happy than anybody has ever had in the history of the world. And yet it seems like we are getting less and less happy. And in fact, there's some data that will back, there, back that up. There are studies and surveys that are out there. One called the World Happiness Report that was done a couple of years back. And basically what they did was they surveyed people, but then they also monitored social media to kind of read the tone and see what kinds of things people were posting. And one of the things that they found was that over the last 20 years, there has been a decline in happiness and enjoyment and laughter, while there has been a rise in terms like stress, anxiety, 
sadness, worry, and then even the, the perception of societal corruption. But I, I don't think that we need surveys and data to, to, to tell us what we already kind of innately know, that we are not necessarily getting happier. It seems like as time goes along, we become more divided, we become more anxious, we become more stressed. And maybe what that should do is lead us to think that the voices that are telling us to be, uh, what it takes to be happy may not have all the information. And, and therefore, maybe it's worth looking at what Jesus has to say. And so in verse 3 of this passage, the first thing Jesus says is, blessed are the poor in spirit. And this is interesting to me because what he's saying is, is the path to happiness starts with being poor in spirit. And at first glance, those two things seem like they're contradictory to one another. That if I'm going to be happy, then I need to be, it's almost like the way to be happy is to be sad. But I think it's important that we figure out what exactly it is that Jesus is trying to say here. And being poor in spirit has to do with how we view ourselves in relationship to God. It has to do with how we see ourselves and how we relate to God. Uh, it makes me think of the first time that I met my, father, my, I met my father-in-law. So uh, my father-in-law's name is Phil. I, I mentioned before my wife, Emily. We've been married for about 13 years. Uh, we have four kids. Um, and we started dating during my sophomore year of college. And so uh, as we were dating, you know how in a relationship you start to sense that this is a, a really serious one, that it's a really good thing. And I started to sense that with Emily, and I think Emily started to sense that with me. And so we got to the point in the relationship where it was time to go and start meeting each other's families because we were that serious about one another. And so I remember when I met her father, or when I met her father, my father-in-law, it was uh, Thanksgiving weekend. So it was the day after Thanksgiving. It was a Friday. There was a family gathering that was taking place at Emily's parents' house that I was invited to. And this was supposed to be it. This was supposed to be, you know, my introduction to Phil, my introduction to her family. Uh, and so I remember I went to this family gathering, but there were a lot of people there. It had a lot of extended family and so Phil and I, we kind of shook hands and then uh, I didn't really see him much for the rest of the night. And then actually Emily and I had to run to another family gathering that evening at my house because she was doing the same thing with my, my family. So we kind of did the one family gathering, then the next one. And then we were sophomores in college. So we were like, well, it's only 10 o'clock. I don't think that uh, it's time to, to call in a night. So we decided to hang out further. And before I knew it, it dawned on me that two things are true. Number one, I need to take Emily back to her parents' house tonight. Number two, it's about three o'clock in the morning. And so I got her in the car, we got her home. And then the next morning, Emily reached out and said, hey, Jimmy, my parents want you to come over again today. And so I, I don't feel like I had any choice. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll be there. So I came over and this time it was just her family, her parents and her siblings. We had dinner and everything was okay. And then after dinner, uh, Emily and myself and her siblings were in their basement. We were kind of hanging out and uh, it's 8.30, 9 o'clock, and her father comes down the stairs and he says, hey, uh, I need to go over to the barn to take care of the animals. Jimmy, uh, why don't you get your shoes on? You're going to come with me. And it became really clear to me within seconds that this was not a request. This was a mandate that I was going to the barn whether or not I wanted to go to the barn. So I didn't have barn clothes, so I borrowed some boots and we started walking. Uh, so we started walking out of the house. We walked past the garage and I see Phil reach into the garage and he pulls out an ax, and we just start walking down this path in the woods to a, a, a barn that I'm not sure even exists. And so we're walking, and I'm starting to panic. You know, I can kind of, it's quiet, it's dark, it's pitch black, we're in the woods. I can see the, the moonlight glinting off the blade of this ax. You know, every once in a while, he's letting it drag along the gravel path so that I know it's there. And I'm starting to think in terms of options. So I have a few options here. I can, I can run. You know, I, I don't know where I am, but we are in Hudson, so it's, it's not going to be long before I find civilization. So I think that's, okay, that's one option. I can fight. Uh, I've got 50 pounds and four inches on Phil, but he does have that axe, so I'm not sure uh, that's going to go my way. But as I was having this conversation with myself, I started to realize a few things. The first thing is that uh, what I ultimately wanted with Emily was a good thing. What it turned into was a relationship that led to marriage, that led to a family, that led to incredible joy. But, but what I wanted with her was a good thing, and that I wanted good things for her. But also that Phil wanted good things for her, and he wanted good things for me. But if that was going to happen for me, then it was going to have to be on his terms. And so as I was having this conversation with myself, that led me to option number three, 
which was to surrender, to surrender to Phil. So I stopped him and I acknowledged what had happened. I acknowledged that it wasn't the right thing. I acknowledged the inappropriateness of what happened and, and the rest is history. I married his daughter, we had four kids, everything is good. But I think that's important because I think what it means to be poor in spirit as it pertains to our relationship with God is to be surrendered, is total surrender to him, to acknowledge a few things. First, that we are totally dependent on him, that even the fact that I can take my next breath only happens because God allows it to happen. But then second, to say, God, everything that you say about me is true. Everything that you say is true of me, I believe is true. And everything you want me to do, I'm willing to do because I trust you. And so what Jesus is saying here when he says that, that we need to be poor in spirit is that we all face a choice in terms of how we perceive ourselves in relationship with God. And what it means to surrender, to be poor in spirit, is to lay down our authority in our own lives and embrace God's, God's authority in our lives to stop wrestling for the proverbial crown of authority in our lives, to say, I will surrender to you because I know that you know what's best. I know that I am totally and completely dependent on you. What you ask of me is the best thing. What you say about me is the best thing. I will trade my authority for yours. You know, there's another section in scripture that I want to go to that, that kind of illustrates this, and it comes in Matthew chapter 19. Uh, it's a story of Jesus interacting with a young man. So I'm going to start reading in verse 16. It says this, And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all of these I've kept, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So as we get into this story, we, we enter into this conversation that takes place between Jesus and this young man who's come to him, and he's basically said, Jesus, I want the good life. I want whatever it is that, that you have for me. What do I need to do to get, what, what do I need to do to be perfect? What do I need to do to get what you're offering? And so Jesus starts by saying, well, okay, have you, where are you at with the commandments? Are you, are you following the rules? Are you doing the things that I've told you to do? And he says, yeah, perfectly. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't cheated on my wife. I tell the truth. I've, I've done it all, but I still feel like I'm not quite there yet. And so the next thing Jesus says is, okay, there's one more thing that you haven't considered. You need to go and you need to sell everything you have and give to the poor, and then you need to come follow me. And what's really interesting to me about this passage is that uh, the young man very obviously doesn't want to do this. He doesn't do this. But not only that, that the Bible pulls in emotional language to talk about his response. It says that the young man went away sorrowful. He was unwilling and he went away sorrowful. And the question is, what was Jesus really asking for here? Jesus wasn't necessarily really asking for his money. What he was actually asking for was surrender. It was for this young man to say to him, I am totally and completely dependent on you. What you say is true of me is true of me and I will follow you no matter what it costs me. Because for this young man, his wealth represented control. His wealth represented his ability to hold on to the crown, to maintain authority in his own life. And he kind of wanted to have the best of both worlds. That's why he came saying, look, I've done all your rules. I've obeyed all your commandments. Do I need anything else? And, and Jesus says, yes, you need to surrender. And he was not willing to do that. And that's what I mean by when I say that, that Jesus wants good things for us. But sometimes the good things are not going to look the way that maybe we conceptualize them. So I would imagine that this young man anticipated that he would come to Jesus and Jesus would say, A plus, you've done it, you're perfect, you didn't break any of the rules. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus said, I don't just want you to follow my rules. I want to have your heart. I want a heart that is surrendered to me. 
And, I, that, and that was really difficult for this young man because he was not yet willing to surrender and therefore he went away sad. And so the key to true happiness, to deep happiness, what Jesus says, the first thing is to be poor in spirit, to have a heart that is surrendered to God, acknowledges our dependence on him, and that what he says is good and true. Which leads me to the last thing, the third thing, and that's how it happens. How it happens. And this is tied up actually in the end of verse 3, which, says, which I'll read again. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the secret, so the secret to being able to live a life that is marked by this kind of happiness, by deep happiness, is that we know, if you're a follower of Jesus, we know the end of the story. We know the way the story ends, so that whatever life throws at us, whatever twists and turns, we know that those who are poor in spirit are heirs to the kingdom of heaven. They will have a story that ends well. Uh, this make me th- makes me think of my four-year-old daughter, Elena, which I'll throw her picture up on the screen. So, like I said before, my wife and I have four children. They are aged nine, seven, and then we have twins, one of which is her, uh, that are four years old. And the past few weeks, uh, Emily and I, I have to be honest with you, we have been uh, at war with our kids in the cozy household. And let me explain how. So, uh, we're having a problem where, for some reason, all four of our kids have decided that they are going to refuse to stay in their beds in the middle of the night. And so what that means is Emily and I are absolutely exhausted because every night we're getting woken up by little feet thumping down the hall and little elbows going elbow first into our faces and our chests and trying to wake us up. And so we've been, we've been trying to escalate and escalate, figure out how we can overcome this. And so finally this week, we came up with what we thought was going to be the final plan that would would solve it all. And so what we did was Sunday night, we sat the kids down. We said, listen, mommy and daddy are tired. We have had enough of being woken up in the middle of the night. This has got to stop. So here's what we're going to do. All week this week, whoever stays in their bed on an overnight for the entire night, the next night at dinner time, will be able to have a little bit of ice cream after dinner. So we thought just your basic you know, positive reinforcement reward system. And so the first night, we only had one who stayed in in their bed the entire night. So what that meant was dinner that evening was a pretty savage enterprise because we had three kids sitting around watching one kid eat ice cream. But later later that week, there was a night where uh, I was home and and we had already put the kids to bed and Emily had had gone out to go and visit with one of her friends. And so I was just sitting at the counter doing some work. And, And as a dad has the ability, you can kind of, you know, you can sense a disturbance in the force. And I just could sense some shuffling at the top of the stairs. And so I went up to the top of the stairs and I see Elena there and she's doing a little dance. And I said, Elena, what, like, what are you doing up here? And she said, Daddy, I have to go potty. I, I'm afraid I'm going to have an accident. And I said, okay, well, another dad thing is like, we don't want to clean up accidents. So get on. So I said, well, yeah, what are you waiting for? Go. And she said, Daddy, you said, you said that if I come out of my bed, I won't be able to have ice cream. And so she was, wi- she was willing to endure that. My point being, the fact that she knew what the reward was going to be made whatever happened in the meantime worth it. By the way, kids will do just about anything for ice cream. That is, that is a, a universal truth. But the fact that she knew what was coming at the end, she knew what, she, what was coming for her, made, changed her perspective on the things that were happening throughout the night. And the same thing is true for all of us because what is at the core of Christianity is that you and I were created for relationship with the God of the universe. That the God of the universe loved us and created us so that we might have a relationship with him. That our sin separates us from him and, and, and breaks that relationship. But that Jesus came so that we might have that relationship restored. That we might have forgiveness of sins and that we might spend eternity with him. And so the reason somebody like Deb Whitus can experience incredible suffering and maintain a perspective of deep joy and deep security is because she knows how the story ends. She knows that no matter what takes place here uh, throughout her life, that at the end of her story, she is with Jesus because hers is the kingdom of heaven. And we know this is true, by the way, because of who Jesus is. If you ever wondered whether or not this is true, you have to look no further than the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. 
Jesus' life shows us that he loves, his life and his death shows us that he loves us. Jesus would say, greater, has no, greater love has no man than this, that he would lay his life down for a friend. And we see that when Jesus went to the cross for us, when he paid our penalty, when he took our sin on himself, he suffered, he surrendered his life on our behalf. If you ever wondered whether or not Jesus loves you enough to give you good things, you have to look no further to the cro- than the cross where he laid his life down for you. And then if you ever wondered whether Jesus has the power to deliver on his promises, whether he is able to follow through on the promise that he makes that we will spend eternity with him, you have to look no further than the resurrection. There is no single line item on the resume of Jesus that is more important than the resurrection. It's the single most important fact of Christianity. By the way, it's, the one, it's something that distinguishes Jesus from any other religious figure. Many religious figures will promise a path, a way, a ladder, a way to be happy, a way to heaven, but only one has died on your behalf so that your sins might be forgiven and then raised from the dead, legitimizing him as the only way to get back to God. And that's how we know it works. That's how we know Jesus is going to hold up his end of the deal. That's how we know that his promises are good, that he's going to follow through, that he is capable of delivering on what he offers for us. And so when Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who surrender to God, blessed are those who acknowledge they are dependent on God, blessed are those who say to God, what you say about me is true, I will give my authority over to you. When he says, we will find life and happiness and joy and a sense of security when we stop wrestling for the crown and we hand it over to the one who created us, he's not simply speaking words. He is speaking life to all of us. So if we want the good life, the happy life, the blessed life, not just happiness that lasts for a moment, but happiness that travels deep into the very core of who we are, then Jesus' invitation for all of us is to come, to surrender, to follow him, and in so doing, to join him on the path that leads to true happiness. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are a good father who gives us good gifts. We thank you that you love us and that through that love, you sent your son Jesus to die for us so that we might have relationship with you. We thank you that you care about our happiness, that you want us to experience joy and security and safety. And we thank you that you have provided for us through Jesus. We pray that as we look at happiness over the coming weeks, that we would see that the life you offer for us through Jesus is so good and so much better than anything else that we might find. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.